so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. San uh, Srirangam Santosh Kumar from HSL Contractors, Constructors, Private Limited in Singapore, and Professor Cho Lokming from uh, Lokming from the National University of Singapore. And uh, today's presentation will be talking about uh, some work that was recently done in Singapore, which has a direct implication to Mares type activities. And we're very happy to have these two presenters on. So if, I, if you don't mind, I'll pass off to Santosh and do you want to kick off? Uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dr. Santosh Kumar, Sridangam. Uh, I'm working with HSL Constructor Private Limited as an engineering manager. Uh, I have here my co-presenter, Professor Chao Lokming. Uh, he is the Emeritus Professor of uh, Bio Biology Sciences, uh, National University of Singapore. So uh, welcome you all on this webinar, uh, Singapore's High Reef Artificial, uh, High Relief Artificial Reef. Uh, before I jump into a presentation, I just give you a short introduction about uh, my company. So uh, we are HSL Constructed Private Limited, and uh, we are a, a regional uh, infrastructure development company. Uh, basically, we do projects related to water, energy, food, and environment. Some of our projects are uh, uh, towards desalination plant, Changi Water Reclamation Plant, which provide almost 15% of water uh, uh, demands to uh, the Singapore. And uh, then we also do uh, food security projects like uh, urban uh, farming projects. And uh, we do uh, flood mitigation projects uh, like flood uh, mitigation canals, bedrock area in Singapore. Also, we are venturing into clean energy projects like solar, wind, and tidal energy. And uh, uh, artificial coral reef is uh, one of uh, these projects under our environment aspect of, uh, uh, you know, our company values. And uh, we are very proud of this project. And uh, it is a very great opportunity for us to share some of our experiences with you. So uh, before I, I, I go into uh, our uh, high reef relief projects, artificial high reef relief projects, I just want to introduce some of uh, you know, the basic terminology, maybe most of you already know about this thing, but uh, just, you know, uh, to give a kind of uh, overview of uh, what is the uh, coral reef. So in nature, uh, the reefs, uh, uh, they extend all the way from a sea floor to the intertidal zone, okay? And uh, uh, the reef supports uh, all the biodiversity across different depths of the water column. Here, what you, sorry, here what you can see is a bit, Basically, there are three important zones. The first one is called back reef, you can see here. And the second one is called reef crust. And the third one is called fore reef zone. So uh, the back reef zone is, uh, you know, it is, uh, it is uh, submerged underwater during uh, high tide time. And uh, it is exposed to the weather during uh, low tide time. So there is uh, a reef growth. And uh, uh, obviously, it is also subject to some atmospheric uh, changes. And uh, the second one is called uh, reef crust. Uh, this is, this is uh, basically, it is subjected to high wave impact, high wave effect. And uh, obviously we can find some kind of reef growth in this zone also. The most important uh, uh, zone of uh, this uh, uh, reef uh, uh, slope is called four reef zone. So this four reef zone, in this four reef zone is uh, about 15 to 25 meters deep into the water column. And uh, here you can, find wide variety of uh, uh, coral reef, okay? And uh, beyond that one, we call it as a deep, uh, deep uh, four reef zone. Um, here also we can find uh, some kind of coral growth, but as and when the depth increases because of lack of light intensity and high wave impact, uh, mm -hmm. the corals cannot grow any, any further. Uh, basically, uh, these uh, there are three types of natural reefs. We call them as uh, fringing reefs. Uh, fringing reefs are, uh, uh, they grow uh, near, um, everything to the shore and uh, into the seaward side. And uh, this kind of uh, uh, fringing reefs, actually, of course, they support the biodiversity. Also, they can reduce erosion and wave energy. And uh, uh, the second one is called barrier reef. And uh, these barrier reefs actually a large uh, uh, reefs they form parallel to the shore 
and uh, obviously separated from the shore by a large expanse of water. So uh, this is this this kind of reefs contain rich uh, uh, coral uh, reefs and uh, with all kinds of marine uh, biodiversity. Uh, these reefs are very effective in uh, reducing the wave uh, impact. And the third one is called atolls. Atolls usually they form, um, uh, you know, uh, surround these atolls to surrounds. Uh, what do you call that? A lagoon. Okay. And these lagoons formed due to the subsidence of uh, uh, volcanic mountains over millions of years. And uh, these atolls also, they have uh, uh, rich uh, coral biodiversity. And uh, also, uh, these atolls, they can reduce a lot of uh, wave impact. So, uh, now we go to artificial reefs. So, basically, artificial reefs are two types. The first artificial reefs are uh, the they, they are the structures and built for some other purpose like oil rigs and all, and they are left to uh, you know after their useful life they are left to uh, coral uh, uh, growths. That means uh, uh, you know uh, these structures just they left there and uh, uh, the the bottom of the structure below the sea uh, they have large framework and because of that uh, they can attract a lot of marine. Uh, you know, uh, uh, marine uh, uh, bio biosystem. And uh, these uh, high relief artificial reefs, um, basically, and another one is called purpose built uh, artificial reefs that we will discuss later. So, these high relief artificial reefs, these are the structures that extend entire, that means uh, almost entire water column depth. This is called high relief artificial reefs. And uh, there is uh, another one called low relief artificial reefs where these structures just cover the seabed and they minimally extend into the water column. So just now we discussed uh, the, the uh, uh, oil rig. So we have seen a presentation in your website that uh, one or uh, two ladies actually, they presented uh, about this uh, disused oil rig. Um, actually fabulous presentation, this disused oil rig as they presented uh, can function as effective uh, biodiversity enhancers because these these structures actually they are large steel frame structures and uh, obviously they are into the correct or uh, we can say ideal water depth conditions around 15 to 30 meters okay where actually a lot of marine um, act, marine biology activity they can thrive okay so this kind of uh, artificial uh, this can become an artificial reef uh, Okay, we if we if we leave them to grow, and another one is uh, we can see on the right side the marker buoy. So whenever you have a tall structure submerged inside the water, obviously it will attract the fish life and other marine ecology uh, uh, organisms. So uh, this kind of uh, uh, marine marker buoys also uh, they can encourage coral growth and also uh, other uh, forms of uh, marine life. Um, so. Decommissioning of this kind of disused oil rig, they cost millions of dollars. And also, um, if we leave them to, to the coral growth, and uh, if we spend uh, some of this money, uh, you know, towards uh, uh, encouraging this kind of ecosystem, then, uh, you know, at least we can, uh, we can uh, replenish the kind of, uh, the percentage of coral we lost, you know, for the last 10 years, I heard around 30% of the coral growth has been lost and by 2100 almost uh, there won't be any quarrel left uh, if we don't take uh, a proper measures so uh, this is the one of the oil rigs uh, they currently they function as a high profile uh, artificial reefs and uh, uh, the, this is in uh, brunei and uh, professor chow and his team dive into this uh, uh, water and uh, they see around this uh, brunei oil rig uh, on the left side, you can see a lot of uh, uh, coral growth has been happening here. Okay, on the right side, uh, nearby that location, there is a boil line, and even you can see that the boil line it attracts a lot of fish life and other flora fauna of uh, the ocean. And how about offshore wind turbines? Obviously, they can also serve as a uh, uh, supporting structure um, for this uh, uh, marine uh, uh, biosystem. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, these uh, up to some extent, actually, the corals can grow 
but for deeper waters at least it can it can uh, uh, house some kind of marine uh, biosystem so coming to artificial uh, coral reefs um, this uh, singapore actually uh, lost uh, quite a chunk of coral reefs for the uh, uh, for the past few years uh, because there is a lot of uh, coastal activities or coastal improvement activities we can say and uh, because of that the natural growth of uh, these uh, coral reefs uh, you know it's been stopped and also we lost a lot of coral uh, uh, area so um, but uh, there are some measures that have been taken since then since 1980s but these measures most of these measures are limited to you know rehabilitation or we can say that uh, the existing coral reefs whatever the existing coral reefs uh, we try to rehabilitate these things but uh, uh, what can we do about those already lost so this is where actually uh, uh, jtc uh, in collaboration with uh, national parks and uh, uh, they they developed this project artificial uh, purpose built artificial reef project and uh, um, uh, hsl joined uh, jtc and national park as design and build partner and uh, nus uh, joined the team as a marine uh, biology uh, consultants and the dha has uh, conducted uh, uh, environment impact study so what are the objectives of this uh, projects basically uh, there are uh, three objectives first of all uh, to have a sustainable solution to enhance the marine ecosystem and biodiversity in singapore waters okay and uh, uh, this actually uh, what the kind of coral reefs you can see in singapore waters is uh, uh, fringing reefs uh, mostly abutting to the shoreline and uh, what we want to do is uh, we want to develop uh, this corals uh, in the open water okay on the you know uh, calm waters we can find some calm waters here by uh, some of the locations open water where actually we can find a lot of sunlight also so to taking advantage of this kind of conditions if we can build some kind of artificial reefs in those waters and certainly there will be a thrive in the uh, in the coral uh, uh, ecology system second one is uh, uh, by having such kind of structure uh, we are expecting as much as 1000 square meters of new space for the corals and reef associated biota so which is very important um, and uh, third one is obviously uh, this is uh, more related to uh, the recreational activities like uh, scuba diving and all also uh, we have a lot of high uh, education universities here and uh, they can have some kind of research uh, facilities you know having this kind of uh, high artificial reefs so apart from these uh, uh, main aims we the following are the ecology aims so attracting all the flora fauna of uh, ocean and uh, coral uh, species and different fish within a shorter span of time this is the one of the main ecology aim of uh, having this kind of artificial uh, uh, hybrid reef structures uh, second one is a uh, substrate fusion which means uh, that uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, soft corals and uh, uh, gorgonians and algae they compete with each other with the stony corals okay for the space on the uh, or a whole uh, reef structure so this kind of uh, high relief structures okay they can provide surface area that uh, enough surface area such that all these uh, uh, marine uh, or coral systems can thrive okay uh, with each other and finally uh, there is a lot of ecological activity uh, nearby the area for example uh, neighboring uh, habitats we have mangroves and uh, we have uh, sea grass beds and we have back uh, uh, reef lagoons so this new high relief uh, coral uh, structures uh, they can uh, they can form together they can form a rich marine biology system uh, you know uh, nearby that area so what is the uh, once uh, this these are the aims so in 2010 uh, ministerial committee uh, sit to conceptualize this whole uh, project and uh, from 2011 to 2012 um, there is a feasibility study have been conducted 
and some locations have been identified. And uh, in 2013, actually, uh, the funds are secured and uh, the stakeholders uh, are uh, identified. And uh, that's where actually uh, uh, Jurong JTC and NPAS actually they came on board. And uh, from 2014 to 2016, uh, DHI conducted an environmental impact study and a site investigation study. And also there was a conceptual design has been made. In 2017, HSL uh, uh, was on board as a design and build uh, partner uh, on the team. And uh, uh, from by 2018, uh, we have uh, constructed the real high reef structures and uh, we launched these high reef structures into the uh, Singapore waters. And uh, from 2019, for the whole year, actually there is there are about 2000 different colonies of uh, displaced uh, corals have been brought to this new high relief structures. And uh, from 2020 to 2022, there is a monitoring program has been ongoing uh, in the supervision of Professor Chow. So uh, what you see here is the southern uh, tip of Singapore and a few miles away from the southern tip of Singapore, uh, we have two uh, islands. We call them as Big Sister Island and Small Sister Island. Both are very rich, uh, uh, you know, uh, tropical uh, uh, flora fauna areas. Okay, they 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 are uh, and Big Sister Island is open to public, and uh, obviously there is a marine uh, park is also uh, there, and Small Sister Island is still not uh, been uh, open to public, but nearby Small Sister Island, actually, um, this is the project site. Finally, uh, it's been uh, finalized. Okay, and. Uh, if you see here, um, the, the the phase one project here, uh, we want to uh, launch eight numbers of high relief uh, reef structures in this area. So, um, how we come about whether this location is good or uh, you know uh, uh, how we finalize this one is uh, based on the environment impact study conducted by DHI. So uh, before we uh, we finalize this uh, location. Uh, various aspects have been considered, um, the, uh, and their effect on the existing seabed and uh, flora and fauna of the ocean. So, uh, suspended sediment, pollution, underwater noise, navigation safety, and uh, uh, you know other uh, seabed morphology, currents, wind waves, ship wakes. All these factors actually uh, they are mutually affect each other. So, the high relief structure obviously have effect on this uh, this uh, uh, fact, uh, these uh, aspects also these have some effect on this high relief structures for our growth um, for this purpose actually uh, uh, dhi conducted so many studies uh, but obviously they started the bathymetry study shipwreck analysis and uh, they have conducted current flow models in order to understand the current and water levels in the area and in the surrounding area Sediment spill model uh, in order to understand the propagation of spilled materials, okay, uh, based on the construction activities the going nearby that uh, that place, and uh, mud transport model. Uh, this is a transport of cohesive materials based on the flow conditions. So all these uh, studies actually have been conducted properly, and obviously uh, they found some kind of uh, uh, you know uh, very minor uh, uh, effect of these. Uh, uh, these above aspects uh, on this uh, uh, on this nearby flora and fauna of this uh, area. So uh, one of the such factors are uh, suspended sediment. Obviously, uh, during the installation time, uh, they advised us to install silt curtains. And uh, uh, second one is underwater noise. They advised us to minimize or, if possible, completely avoid piling works. And uh, third one is navigation safety during the construction, basically, this is. So we have obtained all the permits from MPA, and uh, there are some designated uh, uh, fairways and uh, designated uh, nav navigational approach. Uh, we have decided, I mean, we have uh, uh, taken uh, uh, permission from MPA. And uh, all, the, all the transportation activities happened only in those areas. And uh, finally, there is a, as I said, uh, there is a, bio, a marine biology park, and uh, we try not to disturb them as much as possible. 
so for this we coordinated with npa and uh, obviously the waste management because of this construction and all uh, and obviously the noise uh, also because of this construction activities everything so we uh, we abide by the regulations of npa and the nea and uh, we we carried out our construction works and uh, finally uh, we we also surveyed the macro benthos of that sea floor area and identified if there are any uh, rare species okay directly under the footprint of uh, these high relief structures so what you see here is the top one is a tender model okay and uh, the bottom three are the three mo different models have been identified uh, uh, during uh, uh, during the design phase and finally uh, you see the proposal one uh, has been uh, selected as the most ideal high relief structure so um, this high relief structures basically uh, they they lot of technicality uh, went into this high relief structures uh, before we come up with the design um, and uh, obviously uh, these structures uh, should encourage uh, the coral growth and also it should attract a lot of fish species once the construction is done and uh, you know it is uh, there for uh, several years so um, the first and foremost thing is the height of the structure so the reef structure had to be sufficiently high enough to optimize the sunlight penetration zone okay so uh, for this purpose actually uh, uh, there are total i told you already uh, it, there are eight uh, number of artificial reefs are launched into the water and uh, four number uh, actually are of 7 meters high and the four numbers are around 11 meters high okay and uh, length and width are about 12 by 6 meters for both the structure um, so uh, if you see there are lot of levels a uh, lot of levels uh, you can see along uh, this structure this multi level configuration actually uh, uh, this is uh, in order to take advantage of sunlight penetration uh, along the different depth of the water zones okay and uh, because the top 6 meters of water column it is a uh, very essential for the coral growth and uh, survivability and uh, uh, second thing uh, you have seen a um, lot of uh, um, openings in this structure and it is mainly to encourage um, the uh, current flow the sea water flow and also light penetration and uh, one more thing is um, uh, the orientation of the structure uh, and also the sloping surface uh, we mimic the sloping surface of uh, uh, singapore uh, reefs uh, try we try our best to uh, mimic this kind of uh, roof uh, this uh, not only uh, it will encourage the coral growth but obviously also it will minimize whatever be the sediment uh, that is uh, going to accumulate so it will drop off uh what you can see here the the bottom figure is that we try to increase the surface area of the structure uh you can see a lot of uh, grating okay and uh, this uh, grating uh, we provided on the upper sections on the also there are some overhanging sections you can see okay this is mainly to reduce the shading and also all the air sediment to fall through this grating second thing uh, to maximize the surface area of the coral growth um so a lot of uh, uh, recycling material has been used in this uh, project uh, there are a lot of grp pipes and uh, uh, used steel members we salvaged from our uh, earlier projects like uh, to was desalination plant project and uh, we have used in this uh, structure uh, the main uh, purpose here is because uh, this uh, we call it as fiberglass material this fiberglass material it will encourage the biofilm formation so uh, that is the reason and uh, second thing is what you can see here is the concrete surface the concrete surface actually infused with the rock obtained from uh, jtc's previous project okay lot of used rock and uh, this will also encourage uh, you know the coral uh, uh, growth okay and uh, what you can also see here is uh, the increased the texture you can see the bottom figure the texture complexity we try to uh, you know put as much as a, a possible so um, uh, the most important uh, uh, 
uh, recommendation by DHA is try to eliminate or minimize or try to eliminate uh, this filing possible if possible. So we took that very seriously, and uh, uh, this project, these uh, high relief structures have been put on seabed, prepared seabed. Uh, there are there is no filing involved in this project. Okay, and uh, uh, how can we achieve this? Is uh, you see uh, the 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 base of the structure made very wide. Okay, and uh, we also coupled this base with uh, the steel anchors, and we have installed counterweights. Uh, such that to provide stability of the structure again as the sea waves. So oh, some of the key activities uh, we just try to explain here. And uh, the left top figure is uh, casting of main wall panels. That is what you can see here in the third figure. This one is the casting of uh, main wall panels. And uh, the second one, top uh, second one, is uh, the fabrication of uh, um, bottom uh, structure. And once these uh, uh, these these are done individually, we try to uh, do a trial assembly on shore. And uh, if there is any problem in the fitment, we try to solve here itself. Once everything is done, we transport them by barge, and uh, then we install artificial reef. This artificial reef in two parts. The first one, the bottom part went in. After that, the top part. Uh, you know, they, it is installed over this bottom part. And uh, here uh, I would like to show a video. Uh, we take this uh, video uh, with, uh, from a JTC website and uh, with their uh, permission, I'm trying to show what are the actual construction works that uh, were uh, carried out. Thank you. So uh, we are in the last leg of the presentation. Um, so this kind of uh, high relief structures, um, these are all multi-purpose uh, structures. Not only they anchor is the coral growth, and uh, obviously um, because uh, because of the coral growth, the whole biology, marine biology system will thrive around in and around these structures. Not only that, and uh, uh, the, there are a lot of uh, uh, studies have been done on such kind of artificial structures, and uh, it is well documented that um, these artificial structures can act as uh, buffer uh, zones for the uh, wave energy uh, reduction. So what does it mean? 90% of the average total energy can be reduced um, because of this kind of structures nearby the shore. And the second thing is 85% uh, of the total wave height can be reduced you know, uh, because of uh, having this kind of uh, uh, structures. Uh, what you see on the left side is one uh, of such structure. Uh, it is uh, uh, launched uh, nearby Monaco. And uh, you see the kind of rich coral growth. And not only that, and it also actually reduces a lot of wave impact onto the nearby shore. So by having this kind of structures, it is estimated that we can save as much as 9 billions of assets along the coastal line every year. So yeah, which is a very uh, high value. And uh, second one is the shoreline erosion. So um, uh, there is a, a artificial coral structure uh, nearby uh, Granville Bay, Grenada. And, uh, not only the coral growth, again, um, they observed as much as 50% of reduction in the shoreline erosion, okay, along with the, so it, it, it preserved substrata in that, uh, in that percentage. So what we expect uh, from, uh, from our, this high artificial reef, what we have done, and this one also act as um, both 
uh, wave energy impact okay to reduce the wave energy impact and also to reduce shoreline erosion um, obviously this is uh, one of uh, the most important uh, you know value is in terms of uh, money the monetary terms uh, coral reefs home to about 25% of all marine and fish species and uh, and obviously that kind of uh, uh, rich may, uh, ecosystem will attract a lot of tourists basically the scuba diving and other recreational activities and because of that a lot of money can be generated and obviously it also act, uh, uh, attracts a lot of fish uh, fish types and uh, the fisheries can benefit also because of this kind of a coral uh, 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 reefs and uh, obviously the biodiversity uh, can be enhanced uh, by having this kind of uh, high relief uh, uh, coral reef structures and uh, we know that uh, the coral reefs can be used in a uh, lot of uh, medicine and uh, pharma industries uh, cancer dental care uh, hiv aids and also inflammatory bone uh, pain and uh, parkinson disease what not there are so many uh, you no know, pharma medical industry uh, related to this uh, you know diseases they use coral reefs as their one of their important components and uh, this uh, finally uh, the coral reefs provide uh, structural support that could uh, stimulate uh, the recovery of the endangered reefs and also they provide uh, shelter and uh, fodder for the marine organisms and they can influence the density of the coral larva which in turn they can influence the settlement and the post settlement uh, colony and also uh, the coral cover the larva restoration so uh, this is this is what actually we we try to achieve uh, by you know 2030 and uh, what you see here these three photos are uh, you know the recent photos we have taken uh, a, on this uh, high relief uh, structures what we have so uh, this actually uh, concludes my presentation. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, Santosh. That was great. Um, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask people to ask some questions, and I think my friend Scott Countryman is going to probably ask a question next. So I'll hand over to him after I finish my question. But could you go back to your slides on the applications and uses of coral-derived products? Uh, which one? Uh, this one. No, the one before, the one talking about uh, medicines and uh, the medicine medicinal yep. use, this one. Okay. Um, we have a consultant on the Mars TA called Tom Bowling who runs a business called Biota out of Palau, which captures um, gametes which are spawned from coral reefs, tank rears yep. them and then sells a portion of them to the ornamental fish market and puts a balance, uh, puts a portion of them back on the reef to maintain and regenerate the reef. Uh, as opposed to the current market, which is just coming and stripping stuff off. Do you, are you doing any work or are you involved in any work where um, uh, people can go onto the reef and extract these materials, but do it in a regenerative fashion? So in other words, that they don't just strip everything off and then walk away, but how they look at the husbandry and growing and repainting. Could you just talk to that for a little bit? Uh, actually, uh, Steve, I... I leave this question to uh, Prof Chow, but before that, um, as I said, these uh, corals uh, right now from 20 to 2020 to 2022, still the monitoring, uh, it is in the monitoring phase, okay? Because the, the reefs were just installed in the 2018, and what you have seen in the last photo is in 2019. So it's not even, uh, you know, more than two years. So I think uh, at this point of time, uh, this kind of uh, you know uh, thing, uh, I don't think it can happen. Okay, yeah. but anyway, okay. uh, Prof, I leave it to Prof Chow. Okay, uh, Steve. Uh, uh, in response to your question, uh, no, there there isn't any uh, sort of uh, 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 surveys going on right now for uh, species that have got uh, potential uh, pharmace pharmaceutical uh, uh, properties uh, in Singapore. Uh, we used to have that going on, uh, I think, in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. That's but right. then it, it sort of uh, filtered off simply because uh, uh, people were trying to collect too much of the same thing. Uh, so, so that that was that sort of uh, filtered off. 
And uh, but now we are really going into you know making uh, full assessments, especially the genetics of, of the corals and other bi biota in Singapore waters. And uh, once we have that kind of information, then then we can start to to zoom in on on some species. Okay. Right. So right now we we do have someone in in uh, the University of Nanyang Technological University. He's looking into uh, bioactive compounds uh, from blue green algae, okay. and, and they have been deriving quite quite a lot of uh, interesting products from that. So we know that your neighbours in Malaysia are doing a lot on biotech, specifically on seagrass. Um, we actually wanted to invite a firm to do a presentation, but they politely declined because they said they weren't ready. Um, but uh, be really interested to hear what Singapore does in this space, given Singapore's very strong position in biotech um, and and in pharmacology. I think it would be really interesting to see where that goes. There could be a significant opportunity for Singaporean-based companies to extend out and do work regionally. Um, uh, Gary, uh, sorry, um, Raphael Abasov has asked a question, so I'm going to ask um, Scott to put his question in the in the in the chat. Uh, Raphael is working in Palau uh, and regionally is an energy guy in the Pacific and he's got some questions. Many thanks for the presentation. Is there any commercial inst installations with estimated costs and benefits valued? Uh, is this, this is a demonstration project. Have you been asked to look at any commercial projects where, for, for instance, you might be doing coastal protection for breakwaters or stopping coastal erosion? Santosh, you might want to answer that yep. or Prof. Cho? Uh, okay, uh, this project actually uh, this is in response to what we have launched for the for the previous years. Okay, and uh, the secondary benefit what we can uh, get out of this kind of uh, high relief structures is the the, the what do you call that uh, the reduction of wave impact and uh, the wave heights and all. Okay, uh, yes, uh, this is uh, first of all it's a kind of uh, test bed project. Okay. The test bed project in terms of marine growth, I mean coral growth, how it can fare uh, for a few years, and then if uh, obviously we we would like to, I think we think this project is going to be successful, and uh, then obviously we can have many of these projects nearby, uh, you know, Singapore shoreline. Uh, Prof. Chow, anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, I I don't think we have really gone into these uh, sort of economic considerations on mm. this. I think this is a demonstration to show uh, how well it works in terms of uh, enhancing the biodiversity. Okay. Uh, and then after that, most, most likely there will be, of course, uh, a lot of these economic uh, considerations coming in because uh, the program is likely to be expanded. And uh, the Singapore government has already announced a lot of investments into uh, coastal protection. And, and trying to incorporate uh, nature-based solutions as well. Yeah. So one of the things that's very obvious is that there's a there's a high value of blue carbon, you know, yeah. marine-related biodiversity and also carbon offsets and implications for ocean acidification. Um, we're doing some work on that with the Natural Capital Lab, ADB Natural Capital Lab, which is a joint venture between Stanford University, ADB, and the National Reform Reform and Development Commission in Beijing. But um, and I might ask Deborah Robinson to ask to, to talk a little bit about that for like for in, in a minute. Scott Countryman, can I call on you? Are you ready to ask a question? Sure. Uh, oh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Doctor for for sharing all that valuable information. I'm I'm excited to see innovation for coral reef restoration in any form. And I had a couple quick questions. One is, um, you know, is the assumption that the bare substrate around the project area is not there isn't enough for coral growth for natural settlement are these areas just you know, sand bottom and not enough uh, bare rock uh yeah this these areas are just uh, sand bottom uh and, and not not much rock on, on on the bottom and so the idea is to have these high relief uh, structures uh to provide additional space uh for for corals to grow on Otherwise, we, we just have that that area is just, uh, you know, it's an open sea area and, and it's, it's just uh, water that's uh, uh, flowing across. If I can ask a follow up on that, you know, one of the 
criticisms that we get in our coral restoration projects is that our structures have become fish aggregation devices. So instead of actually uh, in the short term in particular, uh, that the criti criticism is that we don't increase biomass, we just redirect it to our structures where there's better habitat. And I was yeah. wondering if you've done any studies about um, how it increases biomass over the general area and if what kind of activities are allowed. Are, are you going to yeah. be allowing recreational fishing, for example? Yeah, right Right now, I, I think that that has been the, the major criticism that uh, these artificial structures do not actually increase the biomass, but they shift biomass from, from one area to another area. But uh, we, we had some studies earlier on with other types of artificial reefs, uh, ranging from, you know, in those days in the 1980s, we were using uh, uh, vehicle tires as well as uh, concrete cubes and uh, placing them off a reef and then finding that uh, initially, yes, you, you get fish coming from the reef onto these artificial structures. But then as, as time goes on and you have uh, the, the uh, encrusting communities developing on the artificial reef structures itself, then it, it started to provide a, a food source and, and the fish uh, communities uh, uh, started to develop. So in effect, there is uh, more or less uh, an increase in uh, fish production. So it's not just a shift of fish from one area to, to another area. And uh, for, for this particular project, uh, there is a team that is really uh, making an assessment on, on the development of, of the fish life uh, around these structures. Great. Are you doing anything to jumpstart coral growth? I mean, are you using outcropping with coral fragments or coral uh, nursery? Yes, nursery yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, some, uh, this, this project has given us a lot of, uh, I mean, the potential to do some, some uh, uh, good research into this uh, because uh, we also, uh, uh, some, a few of these structures uh, have received uh, coral transplants that have come from other projects where development was going on and those corals just had to be transplanted somewhere else. And uh, so, so I think two or three of these structures have received those. And then some of the other structures, uh, we have left them blank completely so, so that we can compare uh, the, the natural recruitment, natural uh, development of, of, uh, of corals and other biota. Excellent. And well, my last question is on cost and scalability. I can definitely see the application for like high tourist areas where there's um, high recreational value. But for, let's say, when you're looking at an island nation like the Philippines with 37,000 kilometers of, of coastline, um, how does this scale? And so your comments on that would be appreciated. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I think when it comes to scalability, uh, you know, we, we, we just cannot, uh, I mean, that there's no, no one system fits everything. Uh, so I, I think this, this uh, uh, tall relief uh, artificial reefs that, that we are experimenting with, uh, they are applicable to uh, urbanized uh, coasts. So coasts with, with a very high urbanization footprint uh, this is where, we, because we need to expand the space for for the, the coral reef habitat. Whereas in, in other places like in the Philippines, in Indonesia and all this, uh, where you have more of this, uh, I would say not not so highly urbanized areas, they are more, more uh, uh, up, uh, in, in more rural settings, then uh, I, I don't think uh, this this kind of uh, uh, approach uh, would fit well in, into that kind of situation. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, I was just interested, I, I understand Sentosa Island is doing a great deal of work on sustainability and I'd be surprised if they're not going to do this um, because that might be a good business for you. But Prof, Troy, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna ask Nick Lambert to ask a question before he does though. I've just got one quick question for you. Um, you've been in this space for a long time 
and you've seen a lot of people who've been interested in working in it. Do you think um, now is the time has come now, given the the dramas we're having and the problems we're having, and uh, the focus that is developing out of climate resilience? I mean, I noticed Singapore declared a climate international climate emergency in the Parliament last year, which was great. Do you think that there's a this time has come for this sort of technology? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's time to look into this this uh, approach, and and also to you know look into uh, the some of those approaches uh, with regards to oil oil rigs that have been already been uh, uh, mooted. I, I think it, it, these are all uh, approaches that that we should really be be looking at because uh, you know it, it really helps to op optimize. I think in the past we we always think of this as as some some convenient way of polluting the oceans, but but now with with urbanization coming on, uh, I think we have to start to have a different kind of uh, thinking about this. Thanks, Prof. Cho. I'm going to in introduce Rear Admiral Nick Lambert, who was the chief hydrographer for the UK Navy and is the lead technical consultant for the Mar STA. Nick, it's your turn. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Santosh and Prof. Chu. I, what, what a what a fab project, and well done for achieving it. And um, and isn't it fantastic that uh, a, a small island state like Singapore, with such a tiny landmass and such a small sea space, is able to produce such um, leading projects, demonstrating projects? Um, I was really interested in the conversation about the value of uh, how you value these projects and how you scale them, and that that conversation has already run. And I commented, just going back to your early slides, Santos, you were you were talking about the decommissioning of oil rigs, and you also mentioned the two ladies that presented on a webinar a little while yeah. back. One of the things I'm interested in is how do we how do we build um, offshore infrastructure with this um, artificial reef um, concept in mind from the beginning so that in, in which case one would ha what one would do in the life cycle of say a wind tower offshore wind tower or an oil rig or a fish farm or whatever it might be would be you, you wouldn't actually decommission it you would just change the functionality of it through life um, so you would build the structure with your very clever uh, concrete um, infusion technology, with the uh, the different levels and the the um, the flow the flow uh, technologies, and you mentioned the uh, the amount of surface area, you would build yep. a platform for that. So you wouldn't actually have to decommission it; you would just change its functionality through life, and therefore yep. the decommissioning cost would be built in as part of the investment. And the valuation of the platform could be predicted through life. Are you, are you having? I guess you're thinking about that because you're obviously very clever people. But are you having any discussion with offshore infrastructure uh, designers and and constructors? Uh, no, actually, I, right now uh, we just had uh, this project done, so uh, we. The, the idea is really exciting. So we can uh, reach out to this uh, oil uh, uh, oil and gas, these big boys, and uh, if they can uh, inscribe this kind of solution into this uh, their, their platforms, okay, before uh, they launch uh, these uh, oil jacket platforms into the ocean. So uh, keeping in mind, okay, for next 20, 25 years, it is going to work. And uh, uh, not only this 20, 25 years during that one, after that, how this is going to be, uh, you know, uh, can be used, okay, if we left it to, you know, uh, the sea. Uh, no, not, not yet. We haven't reached uh, to any oil uh, and uh, gas uh, uh, this, this place yet. But, uh, Prof. Chow, you want to add anything to this? Uh, no, uh, I, I maybe just want to say that uh, the, the Malaysians are way, way ahead on, on this uh, path already. And uh, really looking at you know how how to uh, uh, make make use of decommission uh, uh, oil rigs, but uh, uh, I, I think structures like this uh, have the potential uh, for which uh, 
where, where the functions can, can really be, be increased, or at least the functions can change with, with time after they have uh, finished uh, uh, delivering their, their primary uh, ob objective. So, so uh, I, I, it's a very open uh, 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 concept can, can be thought of further and, and developed further. Nick, are you done? No, I, I think that's very helpful. And and um, for us in the Mares project, Steve, I think this using examples like this particular case study, which is um, so impressive, and I'm, I, I've picked up on the Malaysia point as well. This is something we we perhaps should pull through into our thinking in in the Mares project, and perhaps have some of these conversations. It's very interesting seeing uh, the chief executive of uh, BP being beaten up recently on a TED talk, and. It was um, it was Shell. Shell. You're quite they pay, right. They pay the good guys. Yeah, sorry, uh, but it, it's um, uh, but it, it's it's interesting if they were to if they were to build these things in right from the get go, um, that they might have a, a more of a fighting chance, and we would all benefit. I, I think um, one of the things that's very obvious from this is that yes, Malaysia might be ahead on the infrastructure side. And, you know, um, I'm very glad they are because they've got a large oil and gas industry and they've got a lot of people employed in it. And it means that they can transition into a cleaner economy, which is great. But there are additional businesses that go off the side, which might be creating this space on their ex new or existing infrastructure. And then there's the additional business of actually developing biotech businesses based on having this available. So it's actually a whole ecosystem. and. Um, Singapore's specific skills in biotech and its um, capacity scientifically, and it's also its ability to mobilise capital and get projects done, put that in a very strong position for Singapore to take part in that. I think that's the sort of order of battle that, you know, makes a bit of sense. So, so Prof Cho, Bo Pai Se Lo. That's Hokkien for don't be embarrassed. So, <laughs> okay, the next question, I'm sorry, I have to see who that next question is from uh gary hessling please go ahead ask your question steve thank you um santosh what a fa fascinating presentation can i ask um yeah these are very special and precious commodities that you're building and establishing my question really comes from an informing perspective so um crazily we in the uk still do not show on our navigational charts, our marine protected areas or our marine conservation zones. Um, are, you, are you sort of seeing, are they going to be uh, shown on charts in your region so that the larger uh, shipping uh, drivers, port authorities are knowing where these are sited? If so, great. But the challenge is a lot of people don't need charts or use charts, particularly recreational. Uh, users in the maritime domain. So how, how are you informing, educating and protecting these structures from those types of uh, users? Okay, uh, as I said, uh, we, uh, we consulted MPA, uh, not only during this project actually. Okay, MPA knows that uh, there is a kind of a marine uh, biosystem is growing in and around this kind of uh, whole development. So I think uh, uh, we have taken enough measures not to, you know, uh, allow any kind of, you know, ships and everything, this kind of uh, uh, vessels to go around this kind of area. And the second thing is obviously uh, what we have to see is the pollution caused by this kind of uh, vessels. Okay, because uh, well, one way or other way, all these discharges into the sea can, uh, can uh, disgrace the growth of uh, corals. So um, uh, I think uh, JTC and uh, and Park they they take uh, uh, proper measures in uh, in uh, you know protecting this kind of areas. Uh, what we know is during the construction uh, we have proper uh, uh, you know uh, what do you call that uh, the discussions with MPA, okay, and uh, they have uh, considered uh, all our uh, you know uh, uh, requests and. Uh, during construction, actually, we haven't seen any anything is happening around there. But after that, after construction, I think uh, NPAC has have already taken strict measures. Okay, so I think uh, these areas, to me, uh, it's well protected from uh, from this kind of activities, shipping activities. Prof. Chow? 
Uh, yeah, uh, the, I, I, it, it took a couple of years, uh, about two, three years, for all the different agencies to get together when, when you know, uh, when, when uh, discussion was going on as to where we should be putting this uh, artificial structures. And of course, uh, the considerations range from, uh, it has to be away from, from shipping, shipping routes, uh, and I, I was very encouraged when uh, it, we decided that it should be put into the, uh, the, the marine protected area because then uh, you, you, you really have, have got very good uh, protection measures. Uh, you don't get people coming from everywhere and just coming in and taking a nice dive and, and enjoying the view uh, because we really need to to follow up with the research and and get get the good research data out of this. Uh, but once once uh, uh, it is decided that we can expand on this and we have to start to look, look for other areas, uh, then we have to start to to think about how how to to keep them protected. Uh, we, without the protection and the management, uh, th these things will uh, you you end up with. Uh, uh, worse uh, damage because people will just as as this becomes like fish aggregating device, then people will just come in and just uh, haul up all the fish. Can I? Thanks, Prof. Cho. Can I ask Scott? You've got another question. Just real quickly, have you ever thought about using your structures as a anti trawling device? I mean, there's so many locations where uh, clearly, if these things were in the water and mm -hmm. The exact location wasn't known. It could be a deterrent to uh, illegal fishing. Uh, yes, it, it can be uh, uh, thought of as that. Uh, it's just that we we don't have any trawling in in our waters uh, because our waters are very constrained and uh, uh, too many ships are moving up and down. Uh, but I, I think there is that application uh, elsewhere where where trawling is is going on. I guess in Malaysia, in in Thailand. Uh, it, certainly, these structures can 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 be constructed to to prevent uh, or, or to discourage our trawling. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, so we're going to have to wrap up here, but I, I just wanted to reinforce the point that we just talked about in the last five minutes: that um, developing these activities is not something we do because we want to be. Uh, be seen as green or we want to get votes. These are things that we need to do to preserve uh, the assets we have in the ocean and the ocean in the sea. What was interesting is the discussion about which departments and which authorities need to be engaged. This is a different uh, but same discussion in every country we're operating in. For instance, in the Marshall Islands, we have uh, requirements for using uh, considering native title, so various groups have access and use of the sea, and so we have to put those in together. And my understanding in Singapore is that the seabed is managed by the Singapore Land Authority, the sea lanes are managed by the Maritime Ports Authority. So, in its uh, uh, in in line with the concept with the duck tours, is this a seabed issue or is this a sea lane issue? I, I, I would think uh, it is it's a marine environment issue. Uh, <laughs> a, the, uh, uh, and and in, in the past, yes, uh, I, I would see that problem. We, we all, always had to deal with the, those problems before in the past, where the different agencies don't get together to, to discuss these things and, and, and to look at the holistic uh, picture. But uh, uh, about more, more than 10 years ago, Singapore uh, started to adopt this integrated coastal management approach. And, and we have the technical committee on marine and uh, on coastal and marine environment. And there are representatives from all the different agencies. So, so they meet every every quarter, exchange news and views, uh, you know, confidence building and so on. So, so that uh, uh, issues like this can be discussed quite freely and then uh, decisions can be taken. That was a point that was very well made by President James Michel, the past president of the Republic.
executives who spoke to us previously, that that coordination and getting people on the same page is very important. Santosh, could I ask you a great fave to go to your last slide, which is your thank you slide? And there's a reason for this that was pointed out by one of the other uh, attendees. So if you look at that photo, you'll see a clownfish. Yes. Yes. So Singapore is famous for its ability to build property terrestrially. Wouldn't yep. it be wonderful if Singapore was famous for building property for Nemo? Yes, of course. That would be a wonderful uh, tourism pitch for the Singapore Tourism Authority. So <laughs> on that note, I would like to thank HSL for helping us and presenting their activities. Uh, Dr. Santosh, Prof. Cho, thank you again, and we look forward to doing more with you and having more sessions. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Steve. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.